Trust you have your Bibles this evening, John 3, John chapter 3, verse 1. Every now and then we find ourselves, we will find ourselves in the book of John. We're looking at John, what I'm teaching on in a Sunday school and Wednesday evenings. But every now and then we will jump into John on a Sunday evening itself. We've been moving through John. We're in John chapter 3. We've been here before a while back, but here we are again. The premise, the focus of John chapter 3, one of the focuses is on a Pharisee, a high-ranking Sanhedrin, one who was a a scholar of scriptures, what they had of scripture at that time. One who was well learned. He was taught well, Nicodemus was. He was taught very well. He was well learned, he was well schooled. Like I just said a minute ago, 30 seconds ago, he was a member of the Sanhedrin Council. He's been working his way up the spiritual ladder, if you will. He's been doing a a pretty good job at it. As he works his way up the spiritual ladder that he was on for many, many, many years. He's earned a lot of praise, a lot of prestige from from those that served with him, if you will. You see... Pharisees believed in in not not only earning the favor of man, but they also believed in earning the favor of who? God. They also believed on earning His favor, their works mindset, is how they functioned for the most part. Nicodemus finds himself sitting at the top of this spiritual ladder. He can't go no higher. He's as far as he's going to go. But there's one who has piqued his interest who's come along. This guy has piqued Nicodemus' interest. Who is this one? Called Jesus. Jesus has piqued the interest of Nicodemus. Is it Nicodemus and his human interest has been piqued? No. The Lord God is moving in the heart of Nicodemus. Like he does all those that he brings to himself. Correct? Because your heart is dead. It's callous and there's nothing in it that's good. And it must be awakened It must be drawn. It must be illuminated with the truth. Nicodemus' life is about to change, and it's about to change forever. Just like you and just like me when we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, whenever that was in your own personal life. Some of you can remember it pretty vividly. Others really can't remember it that vividly. They just know they believe. They believe in the changing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. They believe in what the Lord Jesus has done for them. They see Him as their, as his redeem, as, as their Redeemer. Jesus is their Redeemer. They've confessed to Him. They've come to faith in Christ the Messiah, Jesus. It says in verse 1 in John chapter 3, There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader. He was a Pharisee. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He wasn't your average Pharisee. He wasn't your average one. Like I said, he was a ruler. He sat really high up, called a lot of shots, 
his name, as we said a few times already, was Nicodemus. But after dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Here you go. Here's the interaction. Here's the interaction between Nicodemus and, and Jesus. Here's their interaction together. Jesus, or Nicodemus, I should say, comes to Jesus and he, he comes to speak with Jesus. What's all the attraction about when it comes to this Jesus? Everybody's been speaking about him, whether it's good or bad, right or wrong. Nicodemus wants to speak to him himself. He comes one evening, maybe under the cover of darkness, maybe under the cover of darkness so others don't know, really don't know, but listen, unlike our day and time, we, we live in a day and time where darkness doesn't really have to be darkness anymore, does it? I mean, it's just, it, you can literally live 24 hours a day, 365 days of your life in light. You know, we've got light bulbs, you know, all that other stuff. If, you, if you've ever been to a, to a country that is still pretty much, you know, sets back in a primitive way of living, doesn't have much electricity out really far. I know at times some of the mission trips me and Tina have been on it, and it still amazes me when you find yourself back out in these villages. There's, it's, it's pretty dark. It's really dark. And 8, 9 o'clock, it's dark, and there's really, you really don't know who's coming or going. So I can easily see how Nicodemus would, would pick this time to come to the Lord Jesus under the cover of darkness. He approaches Christ, the Messiah, Rabbi, he says, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. We all know that thou art a teacher who's come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. We all know God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is what? That God is with you. Now, if you were with us just the last time we were in John, one of the very one of the very first signs, one of the very first signs that Jesus is who he says he is was what? If you just if you remember at the wedding at, at Cana, okay, what happened? The turning of the water into what? Into wine. The turning of water into wine. And this was done for what? And this was done to show and to prove who Christ was. Who He was. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, and I'll stop right there before I move on. You see that a lot in the ministry of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. He would do sign after sign to prove just who he was. And the interesting thing about that, there was times when those that were before him, he would block them from ever seeing who he was. Because he did not want them to believe for whatever reason it was in his sovereignty he would place a veil over certain people's eyes and understanding that he was Jesus the Messiah. It's hard for us to understand that. It's hard for us to comprehend that. But that's exactly what happened. He's Christ. He's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He can do with as he pleases. Right? Right? And we need to remember that in our, in our humanness. A lot of times people get upset a lot of things they read of Scripture. But they have failed to understand and realize that the Lord God can do what He pleases. He's the potter. We're just the clay. That's it. 
If he chooses to do what he chooses to do, it is right and it is just. Right? And here he's speaking at this evening to a man by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus says, Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replies, I tell you the truth, Unless you're born again, or verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. You will never see it. Jesus answers an unasked question. And this question, this unasked question, Jesus' response Floors Nicodemus. Floors him. Listen to, again what he says. I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What in the world is Jesus talking about? To Nicodemus. See, why do you say that? Nicodemus' life has been bent on what? A work salvation. A works belief. He's believed all along that he earns his way, right? That he keeps the law. I mean, they failed the law every day, but, you know, hey, they were the Pharisees, so they didn't call the shots. He believed all along that salvation come through effort, salvation come through works. That's the way he was taught. That's what he believed. Believed it for a long time. He sat on the top. Do it. Yes. There you go. I mean, he's sitting on a Sanhedrin council now. He's teaching others to teach this way. Justin said through his genealogy. You see all that. This has been taught to him for a very long time. But now what happens? But now this Jesus comes along and says, no, you must be born again. I remember when I first come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, when I was, the guy I was working with, John Pierce, for, for, geez, for two or three years before I even come to faith, and before Tina led me to, to the Lord, I mean, for most of my life, I believed, you know, it was a, a, a works-based religion. I was raised Catholic. You know, that's, that's just what I believed, that you, that you did enough good, and, you know, the good outweighed the bad, and, you know, and that was pretty much a balancing act, and that's, that's how you got to heaven, okay? If you got stuck somewhere in between, a place called purgatory, well, then somebody would buy you out of it. Sounds crazy, but that's the world I was taught from a, from a child. And here you've got Nicodemus believing, not exactly, but still based on a works religion. Jesus says to him, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. This goes against everything Nicodemus has ever been taught. As Justin said, this goes against his genealogy, this goes against what he taught others, this goes completely against him. Completely against what he thought. Now verse 4. Nicodemus' response is what? What do you mean? What do you mean? You see, listen. This is something good for us to learn here this evening is this. When you talk to somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ, as Justin said out you know, this morning, made mention of it, when you're talking to people about the Lord Jesus Christ outside the church atmosphere, when you're talking to them about the Lord Jesus Christ, you can expect sometimes they're going to respond back with questions. And you better be always what? Ready to give an answer about the faith that is in you, right? About the faith that you believe. Sound familiar? I hope it does. Second Peter, right? Chapter 3. Be always ready to give an account, to give a testimony, if you will, about the faith that you have. 
Here Nicodemus responds back to the Lord Jesus. What do you mean? In other words, he exclaims, What are you saying? How can this be? This don't make sense. Why doesn't it make sense? Because this goes against, completely against the grain of what Nicodemus has been taught and believed all his life. This cuts against it. And like I just said a second ago, when you're talking to somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ, do not, listen, do not go on the assumption that just because they are a church member, right? Or just because they attend a church, or just because they looked apart, dressed apart, that they're truly of the faith. Nicodemus knew the Old Testament Scriptures, what he had of it, better than most. Knew it one way, knew it the other, knew the back, knew the front, knew the up, knew it the down. He knew it. He taught it. But was he of the faith? No. No. What do you mean, Nicodemus responds in verse 4. Exclaims Nicodemus. Nicodemus is shocked. How can this be? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born again? Are you kidding me? This doesn't make sense to Nicodemus. He didn't get it. He didn't understand the things of God. He had no insight at this particular time. Jesus is talking about what? Jesus is talking about a spiritual birth. Jesus is talking about being saved. Jesus is talking about a conversion of a dead man into one that believes. That's what he is saying. And Nicodemus does not get it. He doesn't get it yet. It's shocking to him. And like I said just a few minutes ago, most of the people that you talk to and I shouldn't say most of the people in this area, because this area is pretty much church, whether they're of the faith or not, and you know they've they've got some church background, so many of them. But when you talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ and about salvation, eventually try to get yourself to the point to where you you're, you're probing into their spiritual life to see exactly where they are at. One of the ways a lot of people do it when they talk to people about Christ is, is they'll say, uh, where do you go to church? Or, what church do you go to? It don't really don't matter what church they go to, does it? It don't matter where they go to church. It's not the question. Jesus just said what? Jesus didn't say, uh, you know, where are you going to church, Nicodemus? No, Jesus says what? You must be what? You must be born again. You must be born again. And now Jesus is going to take him to an understanding of what salvation truly is. He's paving the way. How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter into second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus is completely confused. He does not understand what in the world is going on. He doesn't get it. Jesus replies in verse 5, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of the water and of what? The Spirit. In other words, no one comes unless he is drawn by what? The Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that opens the eyes. It's the Spirit of God that opens the eyes to an understanding. When you come to faith in Christ, it wasn't because you were just so innate in your ability to, to understand and to grasp things. 
grass breeding or teaching. No, it's because the Spirit of God opened your eyes and gave you the ability to do just that. To understand who Christ really is. Because you can't do it on your own. You can't. We're what? We are dead in our sins and trespasses. Jesus kind of echoes this a little bit in verse 6. Humans can only reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life in verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is what? Spirit. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. A human can only reproduce a human life. But the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. Jesus just what? He just unloads with the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. He basically just says, this has nothing to do with you, Nicodemus. Nothing whatsoever. This is about me. Your salvation, when you come to me, will be about me. It will be through me, through my spirit. You will have nothing in this, Nicodemus. It's my spirit. It's my spirit. See, a human will only reproduce another human life. It can't do anything for spiritual life. That's what makes salvation so remarkable that's what makes it so fantastic that there was absolutely nothing you could do you could add nothing to this that's what makes grace so remarkable salvation so remarkable you could do nothing there was nothing you could do in this there's nothing Nicodemus could do not not one percent this is all of who? It's all the Spirit of God moving in the hearts of the unbeliever, giving him or her an insight, giving him or her an understanding, awakening their dead soul unto truth. The truth of who? The truth of Christ. That's it. The truth of Christ. Anytime a preacher stands behind the pulpit. He should shrink as low as he possibly can. And as he's reading Scripture and expounding upon Scripture, making a point to get to the truth of Christ, of the Lord Jesus. Because it's not about us. Never has been. Never will be. Nicodemus is early on. Boy, he's going to have to learn a lot, isn't he? He's going to have to learn a bunch. Because for so long it's been about who? Nicodemus. And now under the cover of darkness he's having this discussion... Christ, the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, the Christ. Humans can only reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. It's as if Jesus stops him and says, Listen, there's nothing you can do, Nicodemus. It's my spirit, it's me that gives birth to spiritual life. You can't add one ounce to this, Nicodemus. This had to be like a, like a torpedo hit him dead square in his eyes or between the eyes. I 
I remember when I, myself, when I started really, my eyes started opening to the truth and Tina had come to faith about a week or so before me and before that, I, you know, I was working with a gentleman his weekend, week out, day in, day out. He's listening to this nutty preacher by the name of John MacArthur and then eventually I'm like, I kind of enjoy listening to this guy. I started growing interest in it. And and it was as if your eyes come what? Open to the truth. And now I no longer sat in a car or in a truck on an hour drive to the job site and and thought to myself, well, he's going to listen to this guy. It's good. It's, it's nice to get a nap before we get to the job site at 7, 7.30 in the morning. Now I'm the one saying, hey, put in that guy. I like listening to him never really realized what was happening to me. What was happening? The Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. And we don't even realize it until that time. Jesus to Nicodemus, don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. Marvel not that I said unto you, or unto thee, in verse 7, whatever translation you're looking at. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. You see, what was, what we just said a few minutes ago, Nicodemus is marveling. He's shocked. Why is he shocked? Because Jesus just said by saying you must be born again is this. You in yourself, Nicodemus, have no ability whatsoever to make this happen. None. None. You can't do it. You can't do it, Nicodemus. I mean, you know why Jesus said marvel? Not Jesus knew what was in the heart of Nicodemus. He knew what was going through Nicodemus. That the wheels are on in Nicodemus's mind are just like doing a thousand miles an hour. Everything's spinning wide open. This just does not register to him. This goes against everything he's ever taught. Now Jesus turns and says, "Why are you surprised? Do not marvel. Marvel not by what I'm telling you. Do not be surprised when I say you must be born again." Shocks him. Shocks him. He didn't get it. Jesus, who knows the heart of man, knew what was in the heart of Nicodemus. Nicodemus, the wind will blow where it listeth. You will hear us the sound thereof, but it cannot tell whence it comes. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Jesus says now, the wind will blow where it wants. It will do what it wants to do. It will go where it wants to go. But you will have no understanding about it. You will have no understanding whether it's coming or going. You see, we can't see wind. But we can sure witness its results. Listen, you and I can't see wind, but we can witness its results. Right? What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying this. You can't see my spirit. You can't see my spirit, but you can witness its results. You can witness its results. And now that you hear somebody say, well, you know, they witnessed 
the Holy Spirit or stuff like that people drum up in their mind no it makes no sense I don't care what people say if it doesn't line up with scripture it's foolishness Jesus says you can't he's using wind but what he's saying is you can't see my spirit but you can sure witness its results and then you can take a any of your favorite characters of scripture and there was a change in his or her life some radical in a sense of you know they come from a really rough lifestyle into into faith some you know at, at a young age and come to faith but there was a result there wasn't it Jesus to Nicodemus. Nicodemus. If any man is in me, he's a new creature. All things are passed away, Nicodemus. All things become new, Nicodemus. In other words, there is a change, Nicodemus. That you had nothing to do with. You didn't even see it coming my friend. Did you? Paul saw on the road to Damascus. I mean it was as if a lightning bolt hit him. Here sometimes people will pray that. Somebody comes in, into uh, one of their loved ones' lives or one of their friends' lives and maybe speaks to them and, and something happens and they, they just come to faith. But listen, if Christ has set one out as His, they will come to faith in the middle of a cornfield if that's what Christ wills. If that's what he wills. Guarantee it. Guarantee it. He just does what he does in such a unique way. For some of us, we come to faith. Come to faith in a in a little house. Others it's in the pew. Some of us it's on the battlefield or whatever it may be, whatever your experience was. The wind blows where it lists. The wind blows where it wills to blow. The wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from, where it's going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Nicodemus, my spear will go wherever it wants to go. You'll never stop it. And now we got the last question asked by Nicodemus. I mean, he's not going to speak anymore for a while. He still don't get it. How do you know he don't get it? How are these things possible? How are these things possible? Listen, take, take the experience that we see with the Redeemer of the world, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what I said a little bit ago. When you're talking to somebody of the faith, or somebody about the faith, there might be times when they ask you questions. And you better have an answer. Don't be the guy or, or the girl that sits back and says, well, I, don't, I really don't know. You know. Some questions you really don't have an answer for. They always remain a mystery. But most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the questions that come back to you, if you are talking to somebody about the Lord Jesus, that's not of the faith, it's just the basic same old run-of-the-mill questions. The basic 20-25 questions. Guaranteed. Now, I got any spiritual insight in that? No. I just listen to a lot of guys and when they sit on the question and answer panel, they've mentioned it many times that they usually get the same 20, 25 questions that are asked by whether people are believers or unbelievers. It's the same deal. Maybe one flies out of left field every now and then. 
Jesus replies in verse 10. You're a respected Jewish teacher. You don't understand these things? Jesus answers and says to him, Hey, you're a master of Israel. Don't you know these things? And Jesus, Jesus kind of, you know, he said, Don't you know all this? I mean, you're Pharisee to Pharisees. You don't stand here in council. You don't know this? I thought you were so smart. I mean, you pretend to be so smart. You sit on the Sanhedrin Council. You've gone as high as you're going to go. You can't go no higher, humanly speaking. Why do you not know the answer to this? Why does he not know the answer? Because it's spiritually discerned. He can't. Until the Spirit of God gives him understanding, right? Same thing for you, same thing for me. We'll never understand until the Spirit of God gives us understanding. No matter what it is. No matter what it is. Jesus replies, you're, expect, you're a respected Jewish teacher. You don't understand these things? You don't understand this? I mean, come on, Nicodemus. Come on. I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things... How can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? Jesus is cranking down the vice, isn't he? He's tightening it up a little bit on Nicodemus. He's tightening it up. The more you talk to people about the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation through him, You eventually learn to, to not let them control it, but you control the conversation. Even when they pull you off left field, you, you bring them back and you slowly tighten the vice. What is that? What do you mean tighten the vice? Get them to see their life against the backdrop of the law of Scripture. To where eventually, hopefully, Prayerfully, through the Spirit of God, they yell out, Who can be saved then? Who in the world can be saved? I can't keep that. That's crazy to think of such a thing. How can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from, from heaven. Jesus says, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. No one has ever gone and returned. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 4 mentions something similar to that of somebody going and coming back. Justin even mentioned a little bit about this this morning. When he was uh, preaching this morning, he mentioned about those that claim to go to heaven and those who you know, claim to go and, and, and come back with some just... Just crazy nonsense, crazy stories, and reiterated on that a little bit. And yeah, without a doubt, and here you again, you have scripture saying that no one will ever go to heaven and, and, and return. Super rare deal, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. As Moses is lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. He must. The Son of Man must be lifted up for man's redemption. So that everyone that believes in Him will have eternal life. The Son of Man must be lifted up. He must bear what? The cross. He must bear the cross. He must bear the sinfulness of mankind. Those who wouldn't believe on His back. 
He must be lifted up. He must be lifted up. He must be. So that everyone who believes in Him will have eternal life. Do you see? Even Moses lifting up the bronze snake on a pole in Numbers chapter 2. Even that points to who? Christ. Amen. Christ. Did you ever think of lifting up of a bronze snake on a pole? Numbers chapter 2 will point to Christ? The whole thing points to Christ. The whole book you have laying in your lap points to Him. Not just a part. Not just tear out this page, this is all Christ, and tear out this page, this is all somebody. No, it all points to Christ. It all finds its way to Him and who He is. The Redeemer of the world. It's all of Him. And then you get to this classic verse. John chapter 3. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. God sent His Son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through Him. The love of God to His creation that He sends His Son he sends His Son to redeem those to redeem those that before time He said, this one is mine. This one is mine. This one is mine. Before time you are mine. You are mine. See, John 3.16 is a continuation of Jesus in his talk with Nicodemus. With Nicodemus. So many times John 3.16 is thrown out there and it's kind of just chopped up and it's beat up and it's just it's just just totally ripped apart and misinterpreted, misunderstood, and set off in itself and completely taken out of context. Put behind goalposts from August to January, every Saturday and Sunday. But no. What it was was Jesus looking in the eyes of Nicodemus and saying this. My Father so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Me, Nicodemus. That whosoever believes in Him, me, Nicodemus, should not perish, but have everlasting life, Nicodemus. Nicodemus and we'll close. Nicodemus. Nicodemus, I guess, his salvation would be this. That who should ever shall believe in themselves should not perish, but of everlasting. You see, up to this point, Nicodemus believed in what? All his accomplishments. All his keeping the law. Failed it every day. 
No big deal. Just make up another one. Jesus comes along. My Father so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, me, Nicodemus, me. Whosoever believes in me will never perish, Nicodemus, but have everlasting life. People must understand, and then we'll close, that they will perish without faith in the one and only true God, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. Our job is not to worry about things that we know the Lord has took care of. But our job is to do what He's called us to do. And that's not to say, well, my life is a living testimony for Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's just, that's just a little part of it. But another little part of it is to physically tell others about Christ. When the opportunities present themselves. That salvation only comes through Him. And Him alone. And lead the saving to Him. For He alone. Is the one that saves. He alone. Is the one. That moves. And blows. Where it wishes. When it wills. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we love you and we thank you this evening for this time that you've given us to look upon your truth, your word. Lord God, take this word. May it be used for your glory and your honor. For you alone are the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Bring us back this coming Wednesday to once again look upon your truth your word understand its depth and its riches its meaning we love you and we thank you which in your name we do pray amen